Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around until the last talk. And thank you, Camille, for showing up just in time <laughs> for my talk. I appreciate it. So we did hear a lot about inflammation over the last two days. And I am here to tell you a story about why I think that cytomegalovirus might be one of the most important driver of inflammation in people with HIV. Okay, we know that almost everyone that is infected with HIV is also infected with cytomegalovirus. Uh, and uh, we also know that almost everyone or the majority of people with HIV also shed CMV at some point somewhere in their body. Uh, I did uh, a study years ago where we collected genital secretion from men who had HIV and CMV and longitudinally, and uh, we measured cytomegalovirus and, all, and many other herpes viruses longitudinally, and these are people with primary HIV infection. And it's, if you see that if you follow people over almost a year, almost everyone at some point shed a cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus in the semen. This means that uh, those viruses are very active, even in people with relatively conserved immune system, and even in people that have no symptoms. Uh, this means there is a con continuous bubbling of this virus in the body. And uh, uh, we know from previous study that cytomegalovirus uh, in particular is able to elicit a huge immune response towards itself. Uh, it kind of keeps stimulating the immune system so that uh, at some point up to 10% of all the T cells or even more in older people or people with HIV are targeting cytomegalovirus. Uh, and cytomegalovirus is not only good in, uh, you know, elicited CMV Im immune response, but all sorts of bystander activation. There are many papers uh, showing association between cytomegalovirus and inflammations, both in people with and without HIV. I'm highlighting here one particular paper that uh, um, I collaborated it with uh, Mike Freeman and uh, Mike Lederman a few years ago, uh, where they showed that people with HIV and CMV had actually higher level of CD8 T cell proliferation and also higher level of TNF receptor 2. I'm highlighting this paper because we use this as, as a basis to design um, our clinical trial and I will talk about it later in my future direction slides. So based uh, on this uh, association between CMV, HIV and inflammation, uh, we hypothesize uh, this, this lack of control, this bubbling of CMV that we observe over time in people with HIV might be one of the driver of inflammation and one of the driver of end organ disease uh, in these populations. Uh, this is particularly true when we look at cardiovascular disease, but not only. We have some hints uh, in the transplant uh, uh, community where cytomegalovirus has been accused <laughs> of being one of the driver of uh, um, vasculopathy and complication in people with transplant. And this is one study where they basically showed that uh, people with heart transplant, one of the main predictor of rejection or vasculopathy was not being on one cyclovir, which is um, one of the medication that treats cytomegalovirus. And uh, when we look at the HIV community, Priscilla Shu was one of the first persons that described uh, an association between CMV-specific CD8 T cells uh, and uh, measurements of carotid intima media thickness in the neck of people with HIV, which is a marker, a proxy for cardiovascular disease. In the meantime, this has been reproduced uh, multiple times, both with CMV as a wet, with T cells, but also with CMV IgG. And these are also data from uh, a big cohort study in Italy called the ICONA cohort, uh, where they were able to see that there was a significant um, difference uh, 
in the development on, of non-AIDS event in people based uh, on their cytomegalovirus IgG status. Uh, and the strongest uh, effect, again, was in this, uh, for cardiovascular disease, where they had a, um, has a ratio of 2.3. And this difference was not observed uh, when looking at AIDS-related, AIDS-defining events. So there is kind of, over time, there has been multiple hints uh, of observational study connecting pseudomegalovirus with uh, end organ disease, in particular cardiovascular disease. I do want to point to one particular study from Scott Lutender where they found an association between CMV IgG and neurocognitive, where people with higher CMV IgG had worse neurocognitive impairment. And this was true in particular in people that were suppressed on antiretroviral therapy. There have been studies out there also linking cytomegalovirus to diabetes. As we heard about inflammation and fat, uh, so there are data showing that in fat tissue, there is an enrichment in CMV-specific T cells. So maybe it is a hidden reservoir of cytomegalovirus, although I was never, never able to find it in fat. But uh, there are hints uh, in the literature that CMV might be involved uh, in a lot of adverse outcome. Another uh, interesting path that I have been following for a while is how maybe this CMV shedding might be also associated with reservoir expansion. And these are data from, uh, uh, that again, I published a while ago where I showed that uh, when we looked at CMV shedding and reservoir longitudinally in people with HIV, we can see that people that have seminal shedding of cytomegalovirus over time have a slower decline in the reservoir compared to people that have no cytomegalovirus shedding. And I've been of kind of talking about this story since a while. And uh, I, um, we published uh, a review paper a while ago with one of my postdocs where we kind of speculated about various mechanisms while we think that cytomegalovirus could be one of the driver also of reservoir establishment and maintaining the reservoir and expansion, both by direct uh, interacting with HIV and uh, direct transactivation of the virus, but also because HIV kind of hijacks uh, or uses uh, CMV for their own advantage. I always like to <laughs> tell this story, like cytomegalovirus has been evolving with us uh, through millions of years, and he had to find a way to adapt uh, to our immune system, to escape uh, uh, our immune system, and so he, and he hijacks the immune system. He even produces cytokine that look like ours, uh, in able to really use the immune system in its own advantage. And so it makes sense that a younger virus like HIV might just, they kind of are partnering crimes and work together to hide from the immune system. So this has been like a relatively popular um, idea more recently where many other groups have been starting to look uh, at cytomegalovirus uh, as a driver of uh, reservoir expansion and um, uh, homeostatic proliferation in the reservoir, which makes totally sense uh, if we look at the high proportion of T cells that are CMV specific, but also the bystander effect. And now yesterday I added this slide because I have to give credit to Tim because he was really one of the first uh, that they published this paper using the transplant patients where they saw that when people after a stem cell transplant got immune reconstituted Im the Im rec immu uh, reconstitute the immune system and then they looked at where the HIV reservoir was and they it's striking right like if you look at the black bar which are EBV and CMV specific cells uh, they looked at them together because it was uh, easy and they didn't have much cells but it's striking how much HIV DNA was in those specific cells in the setting of immune reconstitution. So I, I think that Tim also really had a, as it was great that they, you did this study, and I used it many times <laughs> uh, to justify my hypothesis and write my grant. So one of the important questions that we always ask ourselves is, which one is the chicken and which one is the egg? I heard it many times, right? Is it cytomegalovirus that drives inflammation or is it just inflammation that 
reactivate CMV or is it both ways? To start and an answer this question, Peter Hunt in 2011 designed a um, uh, placebo-controlled trial of Valgan cyclovir. It was a relatively small trial uh, and uh, a relatively heterogeneous population, but he was able to observe a significant decrease in CD8 T cell activation in people on Valgan cyclovir compared to people that were on placebo. And this was like uh, really one of the first study that was kind of able to p at least partially um, look at causality between CMV and immune activation. We did go back uh, and uh, uh, generated more data. So Peter went back and generated more data using plasma sample. And uh, uh, he measured uh, TNF receptor 2 and CD163 and soluble 114. And you can see it's impressive, uh, the difference between Valgan cyclovir and placebo. And uh, when we look at the literature, and published data, it almost looks like so the decrease in soluble TNF receptor 2 would correspond to an over 20% decrease in the risk of myocardial infarction and stroke, and almost a 50% decrease in diabetes mellitus, if this holds true in a larger population, which is a much larger effect size than any intervention we, are, we are have uh, ever tested in the HIV population. Um, so Tim already kind of mentioned it before. We do have to keep in mind that CMV is not always the bad guy. And again, going back to my story about uh, um, cytomegalovirus being uh, uh, co-evolving with humans for so long time, of course, like. Uh, the virus is smart, they don't want to kill their host, they want their host to thrive and reproduce and to use it as a vector to transmit. So there are conflicting data in the literature about uh, um, CMV being uh, uh, sometime protective and sometime uh, uh, damaging uh, to end of organ disease. And I think that this deserves uh, much more investigation and much more study. And uh, as Tim suggested, I think that some level of Printing of the immune system might be beneficial, especially for younger people. But I think that some stratification in the population is warranted to find out when CMV is good, when CMV is bad. Okay, so I have two minutes left. So what are we doing now? So based on all of this data, I was fortunate enough to be able to design two clinical trials that are now ongoing as part of the ACTG. One is 5355 which is an anti-CMV vaccine. Uh, the anti-CMV vaccine is an MVA-based vaccine that was uh, developed by Dr. Don Diamond. He is at the City of Hope, and uh, uh, it, it's sponsored by Helocyte, who is the company that is producing the vaccine. It's, uh, currently, we are about halfway enrolled. It's a two-to-one study design, and I'm really excited to see um, how it works out. We are very interested in like safety, of course, uh, and immunogenicity and see if uh, we have some decrease uh, in inflammation uh, after a year of after the vaccine was administered. Uh, so we have very good data on uh, stem cell trans transplant patient, but this is the first time this vaccine has been used in people with HIV. More recently, we opened 5383, which is a Letermovir trial. Letermovir is an anti cytomegalovirus therapy that has better tolerated, less side effects than Valgan cyclovir. Uh, it's a larger trial and is uh, not placebo controlled, <laughs> long story. <laughs> so we have a Letermovir arm and a no CMV therapy arm. And we have uh, a lot of exciting sub-study where we are looking at cardiovascular disease uh, through PET-CT. We are looking at metabolic uh, outcomes uh, through fat biopsy. We are looking at neuro outcomes uh, through LPs, and we are looking at the gut through gut biopsy. So it's a very complicated modular design study, which we believe uh, uh, can really answer the questions. And if, if we are successful, we might be able to change policy and finally have an intervention uh, for people with HIV and to kind of prevent mortality and morbidity.
Okay, so my take home message is that I believe that cytomegalovirus uh, might be ma one of the main or at least one important driver of increased inflammation and immune activation and immune dysfunction, in particular in people with HIV, because they have more activity. Uh, it may also be an important cause of morbidity and mortality and con maybe contribute to HIV persistence. That's my s side story that I'm still looking at, uh, and I hope that I will be able to answer some of the question with the clinical trial samples. And the clinical trial are ongoing, and we hope to have some interesting results in the next year or two. I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have questions? Maybe I'll start with one, uh, which just came to mind. So do we know when uh, people reactivate CMV, is there, or there should be a guess, but has anybody looked at interferon responses during reactivation? So I'm sure there is an increase in the interferon response uh, when somebody is sick, but I don't know about systemic interferon response when somebody have a local uh, yeah. reactivation. Uh, mm. uh, that's a good question. Yeah, that might be interesting to look at because some it could explain some of the divergent effects that CMV reactivation may have, right? Because maybe a little bit of interferon may be good, but maybe too much is not yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, yes, uh, Camille. <laughs> Hi, that's great. In the last clinical trial that you showed with the CMV HIV, vaccine approach, do you think that perhaps there may be an issue of immunodominance between the CMV response and the HIV response that may thwart the effectivity or the immunogenicity of the HIV antigen versus the CMV one? Okay. Sorry, I'm not 100% sure I got to the question, Camille. So if there is... Uh did you get attention? No. no. Sorry. So yeah. So the so that um, vaccine design is a CM. It's a it's a bi immunogenic design. It's a CMV antigen and an HIV antigen. No, no, no. It's no, only it's CMV. Just, it's just a vector. Just CMV. Yeah. It's just CMV. Oh, it's just the vector. Just yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's also, yeah. MVA yeah. vector. MVA. Yeah. So it's not a CMV vector. Yeah. It's an MVA vector with CMV. So it's basically therapeutic ah. vaccination for CMV. Yeah. Right, because yeah. they are already uh, seropositive. They are all seropositive, yeah. yeah. Uh, and is there still a question, Tim? <laughs> oh, okay, Tim? I have to say, I, like, I love the Latermavir idea <clears throat> with you and Peter's study because it, it will select out whether or which human herpes virus is actually doing this, right? So I mean, it's, it's quite CMV specific with the viral terminase being specific and it shouldn't have EBV activity, it shouldn't have HSV one and two, and I don't know about HHV six and seven, but probably not so much, I don't I think so. Well. Yeah. I, I think so because, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. It is pretty CMV specific. So it'd be great to see if that, the Gantz-Cyclovir effect was real, you know, really the CMV driven. So I just, uh, I, I, it's not a question. I just think it's a great idea to use this. And it's oral, it's, you know, it's relatively tolerant. So. It's really well awesome. tolerated so far because we basically we wanted to do this study forever. We just didn't think Valgan cyclovir was a good choice because there are so many mm. side effects. Yeah, yeah. Mm. While Letermovir so far was really so like we already enrolled as not too many patients, but yeah. so far I didn't hear any complaints. I think we've seen thrombocytopenia. We haven't used it that much, yeah. but I think that's the only thing I've seen. Um, but you know, the other interesting thing about, which I didn't know until I went to an aging conference, apparently uh, Gancyclovir is known for um, uh, anti or anti senescence effects, which I didn't know that, uh, which is weird. Uh, independent of CMV. Oh, independent from CMV? So they use it actually in a lot of mouse models together with chemotherapy because chemotherapy induces uh, immune senescence. And so they use Gancyclovir to counteract the immune senescence of chemo. Interesting. Which I was like, wow. Um, so, and I had asked um, uh, Peter about it, but it's so hard to decipher what is the antiviral versus that effect and such. But uh, any more, uh, Dan? Oh, uh, Sarah, have, 
you look, or has anyone had a chance to look at people without HIV to see, who are CMV seropositive to see at what rate do they shed? They CMV? shed at much lower rates. Okay. Yes, I did that study. Not as nice and longitudinal, but we r did recruit a group of uh, people without HIV with very similar risk factor, like people on PrEP, for example, that were MM MSM and uh, and it's really unusual to find CMV. I think we had one out of like 30. It's it's really like, it's really the HIV, the immune dysfunction. It's like the smoking gun that starts CMV and then the CMV kind of takes its own life. If we can say it. I have a question from Sam, uh, I think, who is on? Spanish time zone, I guess. How would you reconcile multiple studies linking higher CMV IgG titers with non-AIDS events and increased immune activation, and your prior study showing CMV seminal shedding was in fact associated with lower CMV IgG titers? Given how frequently CMV IgG titer is used in studies, how might you, desi might you design a study to understand what CMV IgG titer actually represents in vivo? I actually really like that question because I always... Did you plan it? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't plan it, mm -hmm. but I, when I see studied only looking at CMV IgG, I always have this question, right? Like, uh, what does CMV IgG mean? Because I can kind of walk myself through both scenarios. Somebody has been shedding a lot of CMV and then the CMV IgG is high, or somebody has very high CMV IgG and so they control yeah. CMV much better and I, yes, I do, did have one JID paper where it looked like, at least in that one cohort, it looked like higher CMV IgG were associated with better control. But uh, it's one study, uh, it should be reproduced uh, to make sure that that's the same. That one study that we did was with people in primary infection. They had a relatively well-conserved immune system, so it might not be the same for every. Uh, cohort. That was cross sectional. Sorry? It was longitudinal. It was longitudinal. It was longitudinal. Yeah, but I do, I, I do think that the association between immune response and CMV shedding is not as straightforward as uh, just. Uh, so they go in both direction, and if you look at the data and the li literature, they are inconsistent. Like sometimes there are a protective effects. Sometimes it seems to be. Uh, uh, damaging effect. So I think that we really need to look a little bit more deeper into it. And my guess is that if we stratify by age or by sex, we might see some surprises and different relationship. Camille? Hi, okay. So this is in relation to um, now having clarity on what that last clinical trial was. So uh, Francesco Simonetti in his last paper, he showed that in fact you can have CMV specific cells that clonally expand and also express HIV, so the HIV reservoir within those cells. And so again, to what extent might you think that perhaps that CMV vaccine design may affect the HIV reservoir? <laughs> And those uh, patients? I think that that's a good question, and uh, I definitely plan to look at it. It could be in both ways. We might increase the reservoir, mm -hmm. and that's not good. If you expand a CMV specific cell that happened to be uh, infected with HIV, you might end up with a clonally expanded reservoir. We might, as a, what I was thinking, we might even end up making the cardiovascular disease worse if uh, the risk is you know, the so more uh, the immune response that the virus, uh, but we will not know until we, we don't test it. Uh, and I think that uh, I am excited about this trial and being able to put my hands on those sample and measure the reservoir and clonality in particular. And I think Mike McCune had showed in a paper uh, some association with the CD4 cells that were expressing, I think, CX. CX3, CR1 mm -hmm. uh, being also CMV specific, but I don't know if that also reflected in periphery. I don't know if that's something yes. you would be following. Uh, absolutely, and uh, yes, and that's one of the mechanisms uh, 
hypothesized on how CMV might infect uh, because those cells are preferentially CMV specific uh, and they are also targeting fractal kin, fractal kin, right? Which is a marker that is expressed on damaged endothelial cells. Steve Spector, he's at UCSD and he made a f like he published several papers basically based on that hypothesis. Uh, that those cells, CX3, CX, I can't remember. CX3, CR1. Yeah, <laughs> those cells uh, are particularly damage, damaging because they go they and go attack the, the fractal kin on uh, endothelial cells. So that's one of the mechanisms. Great. Well, thank you.